how quite broadly before we get into triple O, do you characterize this trend of speculative realism? Speculative realism refers specifically to a workshop that was held in London at Goldsmiths uh, in April 2007. That was the idea of Ray Brassier, who is now at the American University of Beirut. At the time, he was in London at Middlesex University. He had invited me in 2005 to give a lecture after discovering my first book, Tool Being. And simply by chance, the following year, I had to fly on a strange route. I was trying to get from uh, Nice, France, back to Barcelona to get my flight back to Egypt. I had to fly through London to do it. Brassier was the only person I sort of knew well enough in London to ask if I could crash at his place for the night. Thought it'd be nice to see him again. So I did. I, he kindly offered I stay at his place. And he asked me uh, that evening as I was over at his place uh, if I was familiar with Ian Hamilton Grant at the University, uh, sorry, University of the West of England in Bristol. And I said, no, I actually was. I had forgotten. And he said that Grant had also given an interesting paper uh, there the previous year. And he thought about getting the three of us together for a, a workshop, since we seem to be three of the people who were doing something like a speculative metaphysics, which is very rare within the continental tradition. And I said, I'd be happy to do that. Shortly thereafter, Brassier went to Paris and came back and told me he discovered a new book called Après la Finitude by a French philosopher who's a former disciple of Badiou named Quentin Meassou. Uh, yeah. I ordered that book immediately. Brassier didn't have time to read it. So I ordered it and I read it uh, right away. And I emailed Brassier saying, this is, this is great stuff. We should invite him to the party too. And so then that kind of triggered Brassier's efforts to get his friend uh, Alberto Toscano to organize the workshop at Goldsmiths for the following year. And so the four of us came together. And in some sense, all four of us were taking a kind of realist approach to philosophy in different ways. And, you know, a lot of analytic philosophers in the, uh, in the aftermath have kind of chuckled in that and said, oh, what a great breakthrough, realism. Well, uh, except that realism has never really been a live option in the continental tradition the way it has in the analytic tradition. Right. The, st the standard continental position on realism was always the Husserl-Heidegger position that it's a pseudo problem, whether the world exists outside the mind, because we're always already outside of ourselves and in intending objects or in using equipment. And therefore, the whole realism, anti-realism dispute is, is a false problem. And we weren't exactly the first in the continental tradition to question that. There was always Nikolai Hartmann, who was a contemporary of Heidegger, but he kind of fell by the wayside in the wake of phenomenology, and he's just being revived now. Then there was Maurizio Ferraris in Italy in the early 90s. And then there was Manuel de Landa, who's a realist delusion, who started the same year I did, 2002, when I wrote my realist interpretation of Heidegger. So it is, it's pretty new. It's 20 years old or so in the continental tradition that realism has been a a live option, and it's not being accepted. The, the standard continental objection to us is still the same one, that transcendental philosophy somehow renders the realism, anti-realism disputes a pseudo problem. So that's what made us different, I think, as a group. And we only held two workshops. We held another one two years later, and Mayasu already didn't attend uh, for that one. So already wasn't the same group. And then shortly after that, there was a falling out among some of the group members. So it never, never appeared again. And it's turned into kind of a feud. Although right. I, I see that as not so important because speculative realism is out there. People are referring to it. You know, there are book series, there are journals about it. It did its work, regardless mm -hmm. of what the former members think about it. Now it's, it's out there as a live option. Yeah. And it seems like within speculative realism, triple O, the launching point, and you've already touched at this, is a sort of skepticism about our connection to the external world, uh, so, which I think of as something like the, the Kantian noumena. And in your book, Object-Oriented Ontology, um, A Theory of Everything, you write that since reality is always radically different from our formulation of it, and is never something we encounter directly in the flesh, we must approach it indirectly. And mm -hmm. this brings me back, or when I read it again, I think of what you, the story you told about the Islamic philosophy and the, the cotton and the fire and how the cotton mm -hmm. and the fire are never intera interacting directly with one another. It's just 
uh, I think you said making caricatures of one another. They're interacting with perhaps properties of one another. And I guess first I, I have to ask why it is that reality is something we aren't in contact with, because it certainly seems on the face of it that that's what I'm in contact with right now uh, when we're talking and then how it is that we're supposed to approach it indirectly then. All right. Uh, you called it skepticism, which a lot of people call it as well. I like to call it instead a very committed form of fallibilism. Um, so for me, the reason it's not quite a skepticism is that you can gain some sort of indirect access to reality, but it's indirect. And I would just okay. say, first of all, I think that's what philosophia has always meant in the true sense, going back to ancient Greek philosophy, that wisdom is not attainable. There's a kind of love of wisdom. And um, I think what's happened is that in the modern period, we've become so enamored of the great success of the natural sciences that we've started to rethink of philosophy as a form of knowledge. It's perhaps the most general form of knowledge. Whereas for me, philosophy yeah. is absolutely not a form of knowledge, not so much because I'm a skeptic, but because I'm not a literalist. Uh, knowledge for me is essentially a, the, knowledge comes in two flavors for me, which I call undermining and overmining. Somebody asks you what something is, you can tell them what it's made of or tell them what it does, or both at once. Those are really the options. And when you're doing that, you're losing sight of the thing itself. You're either expressing it in terms of the historical backstory behind it or the pe smaller pieces it's made of, or else you're going the other direction and talking about its effect on the mind or the effect on the world. Where whereas that's it's neither of those things. It's more than its pieces and it's less than its effects. It's a kind of third level in between those. And that's a third level you have to get at indirectly. And I guess I'm already talking here about the indirect point, which was your second question. So maybe I'll just start with that one. Um, literalism for me, which is the underpinning of every form of knowledge, is a form of Hume's dogma, as I see it, that objects are really just bundles of qualities. That uh, to know an object, all you have to do is successfully state truly all the properties it actually has. And then you've got the knowledge of the thing. And even if we add the proviso that we know we're never going to get it completely, I think that's a wrongheaded way to look at the object. Because for me, the object is always in tension with its qualities. The object is something fundamentally different from its qualities. Uh, and so, incidentally, I don't think this is a new idea. I think you get this from the minute that, um, no later than Aristotle def uh, talking about substance and saying, uh, if it is not philosophy, then what discipline is it that asks whether Socrates standing and Socrates sitting are one and the same, which is kind of one of the funny passages in the metaphysics. But what he's hmm. saying is that Socrates can be Socrates and has only a loose relationship to sitting or standing. Right. Uh, that even right. though Socrates, yeah, even, even though he's always doing one of those or the other, uh, an object has only a loose relation with its own qualities. And that's, that's right. a, a bulwark of Aristotle's theory of substance. Yeah, I think um, you're, what you're referring to is that there's this usia, or I think it's the the ultimate subject of predication that is different from these predicates themselves. Yes, and I wouldn't call it a bare particular because each one has its own specific essence. And I just don't think the essence can be summed up additively by listing all the qualities that make it up. It's, it has more of a unity than that. And then a couple other moments, uh, one of them would be in uh, Leibniz early in the monadology, I think it's paragraph seven, where he says every monad is one, but it also has a plurality of qualities. Otherwise, all monads would be interchangeable. And so then there's another insight uh, there that uh, the object, the monad and its qualities are in tension somehow. And then finally, the phenomenal version that comes back in Husserl, I see Husserl primarily as a strong anti-Humean because in Husserl's case, uh, what phenomenology is all about is the various adumbrations of the thing can all be stripped away to get at the essence. And so you have an intentional object, which is something deeper than all of the possible adumbrations. You don't get the thing by adding up all the different viewpoints somebody can have on it. You have to strip all those away to get towards the essence of the intentional object. And then what Husserl does is he comes to the essence and he makes what in my mind is a large mistake when he says that it's the intellect that knows the essence. It's only the senses that are trapped at the level of the adumbrations. Whereas again, for me, the intellects can't get at the thing any more directly than the senses can, any more than praxis can in Heidegger's sense. That the thing itself is always something more than any human access to it or indeed any causal interaction with it. 
And so um, that's what I mean about indirect uh, access to the thing. And it takes many forms. Some of them are aesthetic because obviously in the arts, the goal is not to produce knowledge. That's a, it's a, an important form of cognition, I would say, aesthetics. But it's not one that can be literalized. If you try to explain in prose terms what the meaning of a Picasso painting is, you're not going to have exhausted it. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, there is a literal element to paintings. I don't know if you saw the story today. They just renamed one of Van Gogh's paintings, which had been called that. yeah, it had been called for 80 years uh, "Red Cabbages with Onions." until a chef noticed it was actually garlic. No one had noticed this. So just today they renamed it, uh, or at least the story was just today, they renamed it Red Cabbages and Garlic. So that <laughs> that's a literal change that changes the painting in some way because it changes what the painting is indexing. But primarily you're not trying to gain knowledge from your account of an artwork. And there are other examples like uh, rhetoric, which is frowned on these days, but was a great branch of classical education because Aristotle tells us that in rhetoric, it's a matter of the background. It's a matter of something you don't say. Like uh, if you say this man was crowned three times with laurel, you're not supposed to say because he won the Olympics three times because every ancient Greek knows that. And it's rhetorically more powerful to imply that rather than to say it. And so uh, rhetoric is also something that lies in the background that you're not literally stating because it's somehow cognitively more powerful to leave certain things unsaid. Um, I think the case of speech act theory is related to this when they talk about performative statements as opposed to constitutive ones, which are merely communicating literal facts in their statements, whereas a performative statement is committing you to something. It's it's changing reality rather than just uh, transmitting literal information. So all of these different things play a role in human cognition. They are not all forms of knowledge. And... Uh, in some way, they're all indirect as well. And I think just not enough has been said about this because we have been so eager to mimic the natural sciences and do everything the way they do. And I think that's, that's even more true of analytic philosophy, obviously. Yeah, so absolutely. That's actually what I was going to ask you about. Um, before we get back to triple O, mm -hmm. uh, a comment you made that you don't think of philosophy as a form of knowledge. I found this very interesting. And I was wondering if if this is just a Graham harmonism or if this is a common way of thinking about philosophy in the continental tradition, because as you mentioned, at least for those analytic philosophers who think of philosophy as being continuous with natural science, right. philosophy can lead to knowledge in the same way that science can. I think in the negative sense, in continental philosophy, you find a certain uh, resistance to incorporating the natural sciences uh, that comes very much from Heidegger, who infamously claimed that science does not think. I don't think people in continental philosophy tend to spell out exactly what the implications of that are. So no, that, that's not something I just picked up atmospherically when I say that philosophy is not a form of knowledge. Um, it's something I came up with through my own work, but then saw that in my view, that's already what philosophia was about in Socrates and to some extent in Plato and Aristotle. But yes, the, it, I think it's one of the regrettable facts about continental philosophy that it, people tend not to be as well educated in the natural sciences because they tend to see it, maybe enemy is too strong a word, but they tend to see it as something other than what they're doing. So I guess in that sense, I bear the stamp of the continental tradition from which I come. But um, uh, I think that's more in the negative sense in the continental tradition. I don't think there's, you, you don't find much of a positive elaboration of how philosophy differs from the sciences.